Copyright University of Auckland, all rights reserved. The content and delivery of lectures in this course are protected by copyright. Material belonging to others may have been used in these lectures and copied by and solely for the educational purposes of the university under licence. You may record the lectures for the purposes of private study or research, but you may not sell, alter or further reproduce or distribute any part of these lectures to any other person. Failure to comply with the terms of this warning may expose you to legal action for copyright infringement by the copyright owner and or disciplinary action by the university. Okay, so the floor is yours. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming by for the lunch presentation or um, afternoon presentation. So, um, as Jesse has mentioned, I mean, I, I, I just uh, moved here more than nine months or ten months actually. To, um, but I used to work for mostly in the UN families as well as with USAID to DRR and um, climate change adaptation activities in the Pacific as well as in Asia, uh, based in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts and one case study on this uh, probabilistic early warning systems. And maybe I put, you may be seeing that it's end to end to end. Normally we always try to talk about end to end, which is start and ends. Why there is one more ends is required, which is always like a feedback. So you always try to keep in phrase like it should be E, 3E, not E to E. And then how actually you could actually use some of this latest state of art science and research that you are doing in your academic area, how that could be integrated into an operational domain, which is like a Met Office or other a civil defense authority works in each country, and how that could be actually integrated into your decision-making process, which is like a community at the end. They use the information to get benefit. And that's how actually the science could contribute to the societal benefit. So that's one case study I like to talk here, but just before that, maybe we just a little bit discuss about, about the overall early one systems. So I try to put together my talk today, basically uh, to discuss about what do we understand as a whole about an early warning system or an end-to-end-to-end -to -end -to -end early warning system. And then where it comes like a probabilistic versus deterministic approach because you know, every, everywhere you go, we talk with, especially with the policy makers or decision makers, there's always a challenging with how you deal with this probabilistic versus deterministic information, and then how you deal with the uncertainties, and how the uncertainty could, could bring you an opportunity. And then we will just, from the theoretical aspect, I'll just directly go with one case that how we are able to achieve some of the success. So, I mean, I, I, I'm working on this, uh, I started my career as an operational forecaster uh, since maybe 2000, not too long, but quite long, it's 15 years almost. And uh, over the 15 years, I worked only on this early warning business actually in my country as well as many other countries in, in the region. So my, my basic understanding is that if you look at the horizon of from 70s to till today, I mean, till 80s, your Early warning is almost depending on how you want to save your lives. Though there was not much warning available in, in those days, but whatever used to be available is mostly focused on save lives. And then early 90s, you see it most go with the sectoral approach. So it looks at about savings lives and how actually it contributes to your livelihood or your saving of properties. And then right now, or at this pre present state, we are trying to looking at more on opportunities through new or emerging technology that is available throughout the globe. So how we can actually harvest those technologies to bring into practice and apply in our uh, uh, coping up with a natural disaster. But even, I mean, despite there was uh, so many forecasting is available from the decades, but I think the, the Surprise actually came up with the 2004 tsunami in the uh, in Indian Ocean where almost 250,000 people died. 
but there was a there was a warning, but there was a no communication. There was so even there are a lot of lot of challenges in the early warning system, and the second shock could be the cyclone Nargis in 2008. Even though you had a good warning system, but you see that almost 10,000 people died in Myanmar. So, so that that brings up to an idea that why our warnings fails. What what, what are the reasons that we uh, we, we need to deal with an early warning systems. But again, I mean, when you discuss with the early warning into a DRR domain, which is a disaster risk reduction domain, because in the, in the past, if you go to a Met office, if you talk about early warning, they will say, we generate forecast and we pass it to our door. So that's like end to end to us. That's their mandate. They don't deal with uh, people. <laughs> because their, their job is to dealing with science and producing the information and send it to the respective authorities, and they're, they're done. But it's not a not whole scenario, actually. So if, if you look at the DRR domain, we, we always want to know how early is early we are talking about. Is it six hours? Is it one hour? Is it one week or one day? And then what constitutes to a warning system? And then what is meant by a system when you are talking about early warning system? And then how weak is your link? Because it has a lot of chain. It's like a one built with another. And if you fail in one single component, your whole overall system fails. So even though you have a good scientific information, but if a civil defense authority didn't able to disseminate it to the right people in the right time, it doesn't make any sense as a scientist what we are producing at the Met Office or at the industry level. And also it de deals with that how to reduce this community impact based on your information flow. I mean, how you interpret and respond. Because as a human, you don't respond unless you internalize your information. So that means even though I know the risk, unless I accept the risk, I don't act on it. So if you go to the road, there is a high probability of an accident. Does that mean that you are not going to cross the road? You will cross the road by taking the risk. So you have, to, you have to internalize the information. Unless you internalize, you actually don't respond. So as, as I was talking about the reason of uh, failure of warning, I mean, even if you look at from since la whatever our memories goes, say, since 80 to till today, in every single case, you'll see that there is a good warning. Even a last case in Fiji in uh, the cyclone Winston in Fiji. We all knew from three days in advance that the, uh, the cyclone itself is approaching to Fiji and it's going to be hit in certain time. What are the locations? Everything was known before. But even though the death toll was 44. And if you look at the damage, I mean, 600 people was uh, out of shelter which is more or less 6% six, six of their total population. It's a huge, even though it's a small community. And in terms of economic damage, it goes, it's still there counting, but it's maybe more than 250 million they count up to date. But even if you look at a little bit past, say, uh, uh, Typhoon Haiyan in the uh, Philippines, we all knew five days in advance, because that's, that's a very pretty standard cyclone itself. We knew that the cyclone is approaching to the Philippines. It's going to be hit. What would the storm surge look like? But even though you see the, the damage is more than, I mean, 10,000 people died. So, so what do you think? Why our system fails? What is the ma major reason that it didn't work? Can, can anybody respond from the audience? Yes. And it's probably the people who are going to be affected, they don't understand what the warning is. Absolutely. So it's like an interpretation. They don't understand the meaning of science information or the forecast information. Any other thought? Well, with Fiji, they, it was coming in from a different direction than the cyclones when it comes to the islands that were warned. Normally don't get hit as badly as they were this time. They're like, oh yeah, it'll be a cyclone. And yeah. They were sort of ready, but not for the actual impact of this cyclone as opposed to ones that have had before. Yeah. So they knew, but they are not ready for or they didn't uh, understand that how, what would be the magnitude would look like. And also there is uh, not enough facilities to strong infrastructure, probably. 
So, so what I summarize actually, there's a three major reasons we can actually come up with uh, our warning phase in every single case, or there was also some success. So one is warning not understood, as you said. I mean, people doesn't understand, or there is no warning itself. You can say, and then second could be warning understood. People understand, but they ignore because they don't. They never faced in their lifetime. So, like in a cyclone, um, Nargis. I, I was a forecaster from the regional office, and I sent out the forecast. But the people in their last 100 years memory, there was no cyclone hitting that particular area. So they, they ignored it, the total information. They said, OK, it can come, but in, it never damaged in our home and property. So they ignored it. The third one is that, no, people understand. They're not ignorant. They, they are quite realistic. But there is no response. That means you don't have enough infrastructure. So if you don't have a shelter, like a, a cyclone case in Argus or a, a cyclone in uh, Winston, if you look at the infrastructure, there is not so much cyclone shelter. Even though the shelter they have identified from the government, those are like half of meter water when the, the cyclone hit in the, in the country. So where they will go? And uh, most of their house was blown out with uh, 250 kilometer per hour wind speed. So even they don't, doesn't understand how the when you, when you speech could impact them. So th this, is, this is the main three reason that we always see the system fails. So I, I always say like a, an early warning is like a system of a system. If you say like DRR, disaster risk reduction, it's, it's a domain and it's, it's an overall system so where you have all these four components, preparedness, response, recovery, mitigation, all, all sort of things. But even if you come to an early warning system which goes mostly under the preparedness domain. But even if you look at inside of a overall early warning system, it's like a system of system. So if you, if you, don't, if you don't follow all this component, it fails. And if one system fails, your whole this DRR system actually fails. So if I just summarize the, a component of an early warning system, it looks like it's a bit messy and very complex. It's not so easy, actually. It's just not one to one. So it started with an institutional arrangement, like mandate, who is going to provide what and who will do what. If you don't understand this kind of mechanism, the total system fails. The case for uh, flood in 2011 in Thailand. You saw that, that was a massive flood. I mean, even though there was a good coordination at the institutional level, it could be flooding because there is no way you could actually protect the flood because the water, uh, the um, excess rainfall was like a 140 percent. So you have to have a flooding, but it could be reduced the uh, magnitude. Like my house was completely flooded, and most of my friends was blaming me. A flood modeler never lives in a floodplain. <laughs> so even though we didn't know that our area is a floodplain because there was a risk assessment was totally wrong. And you saw also that how the insurance company has paid like 5 billion baht damage compensation because of their wrong assessment in that particular area. So that, that was a history, good, good history. But it, so if you look at the end-to-end the -end -to -end system, which is, so start with your institutional arrangement, then it comes with the observation systems. You have to have a good data for your modeling systems that brings to you how you actually also collaborate with the international database like GTS. How many of you know about GTS? Did you hear about these things? It's like a global telecommunication system which are maintained by World Meteorological Organization. So under the, that framework, all countries actually share their observed database within the system so that when you do a climate modeling, when you do a weather modeling, you can actually access the data globally. Because when you predict, I mean, trying to set up your weather models, it's not only your country. So you have to look at the region, you have to look at the outside of your boundaries and how you access those data. So that's the one mechanism that you can access the global database. And those are very important if you want to do a either hydrological modeling or climate modeling or weather modeling whatever modeling you want to do to predict your future scenarios. 
and then it comes with a hazard detection warning and product that you develop your bulletin. In most of the cases, we blame that the product that we developed, it doesn't understand because if we write a oh, gust wind is this much. So what does a gust wind means by a farmer who helps no, um, who is illiterate basically. So you have to give them some understanding that how they could actually interpret those into a very simplistic way so that they can respond to that kind of information. And then how you disseminate and notification of the information because you need to have a multiple and redundant system for your warning dissemination system. And then more complex is also within the community that how they respond because there are a lot of social, behavioral, and physical system integrated into the human things. So, yeah, and that's maybe the most complex part. And unless they respond properly, the whole effort from the backward is not working. And it needs to be also a feedback loop to the scientists so that they understand that how or uh, whatever the information they have produced, how much people understand and how they respond to that particular information. So it's, that's why I put one more end. So if you, if you just summarize, I just put it into a more simplistic way here. So which is like your observation, data analysis, risk assessment, you're predicting, and then you warning formulation and then dissemination and community response. But in each of these cases, there are a lot of gaps still remains in every country. It's starting with a developed to a developing world, if you compare, you'll find there are always some gaps. And if you have a gaps, that's the big hole could create during the emergency situation. And that could fail your overall system itself. So I did a assessment two years back, mostly in the Asia and some part of Africa, that how actually the system's capability. So you can see that the, the red means so it's a zero capacity, that means they are very weak, and the more green is like they are very strong. So you can see that in every country they have a maybe good observation system, data transmission, hydrological modeling capacity, then uh, they also integrate like numerical weather prediction, which is like a, a different weather scheme for three days to seven days to 15 days. They try to integrate that to increase their forecasting period for different hazard. And then when it comes to the end, the capacity to generate tailor-made forecast, which we are always talking about to interpret the science information to the local level use and how they respond, this is very weak. Even a country like a China, if you look at it's the China, yeah, China is here. So you have a very good observation system, modeling system, but when it comes to the community level, it's pretty weak. I don't know how you um, pretend about the New Zealand, but probably if you come to here, you'll see maybe a yellow or a little bit greenish, but not fully you know, strong enough to, to integrate into the system. And if you have one weak link, your whole link is actually weak. So you cannot say that, okay, we can ensure that we are resilient at the end of the day. So part of it, I, I, I believe, is that because not tangible enough benefit beyond saving lives, which we don't understand very well yet. And also, we unwelcome early warning system could hurt potential development, that how actually we integrate the system within the different se sectors, because each of these sectors has differential needs. If you go to the agriculture, they have a differential needs. If you go to the business community, they have a differential needs. If you go to the tourism, then they need to know different information. So how you actually customize the information to sectoral needs. And also, um, not much incentive into this particular sector that could work on this uh, um, to, to regain the, the situation. And also, fading the memories, because we always forget. If, we ha if something happened today, after 10 years, we actually, f not even 10 years, after five years, we don't remember what happened actually. So it gives us like a, a new shock. We always say it's a big surprise, a, 
uh, wake up call, something like that. You always come up with a new catchy words. But if you look at the past history, you always had those kind of uh, situations. So I always try to say, we never learned our lessons because we always identify lessons, which is uh, nicely documented in the book, but never learned from there. And then we, we fail again and again. So now coming back to the probabilistic versus deterministic approach. A anyone like to share what do you understand by a probability or a deterministic things? Any idea? So in a sense, like a deterministic, which is you know the end result. So everything is determined. So and policymakers and decision makers, they love this information. They don't love the, any uncertainty. And probability means there is a certain. So it, it has, it's, you don't know the end result. There could be, it could be, it may happen, it may not happen. So that means if I say that, okay, there is a, I can give you an information which is a 60% probability. That means out of 10 times, four times I must go wrong because that's the fundamental here. And these four times could be happen beginning of four out of 10, or it could be consecutive one by another. So think of that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a user perspective. As a user, if I tell you first four times all wrong information, how you built a tough trust on me. You will absolutely completely say, oh, I don't trust you anymore. But if you are successful on your probability that, okay, first two times you are right, three, third times you are wrong, there is a chance of, you know, win-win situation. So this needs to be understood by the decision makers and policy makers as well as users. So when you're dealing with a probabilistic information. but and then it's, it's a very hard for a scientific domain to come up with the deterministic results because everything is uncertain. Starting with uh, your data collection, your modeling, your science, each single phase or each single element has a, some sort of uncertainty. So if you add all those uncertainty, cumulative uncertainty, it would be a little bit more. And then the problem is that how you actually communicate this uncertainty to users or how you're actually dealing with this uncertainty. One way that we don't deal it, so we don't use those advanced science information. Another one is that, okay, we, tr we try to, we always take chances as a human being. We do ch take chances, everyone take chances. So let's deal with these chances that how we can actually adjust our thinking versus so indigenous knowledge, our perception, and then versus science perception. We mix up together to make a decision. And if you look at the, the user perspectives domain, so this I try to put here like a uh, user needy, you see that. So science has a limitation. So it can go at certain certain point. Say for if you're looking at the early warning perspectives for in forecasting, a weather forecast can go maximum three day good, maximum seven days. After seven days, we don't count it as a as a good forecast because it has a maybe ten percent probability. So so beyond seven days, you cannot look at your horizon. So if you look at your flood forecasting, people always want okay if you can give me one month, if you can give me one year advance. I can give, I can do something else, but it's impossible. So if your if your weather can go maximum seven days, you can look at your flood maximum seven days using your weather prediction. And then if you look at about climate change and those kind of things, those are more vague. It's like a one percent of probability. So that's you cannot use your operational domain. So so there there is already a gap between your know your demand versus and need versus the capacity. So you have a limited capacity, but you have a very long horizon demand. So how we adjust these things? So, so and again, I mean, if you look at here, so the more you go with a forecast horizon, the more your uncertainty increased. So if you say, I can give you a one day 80% probability, three day would be 60, seven day would be 40, something like that. 
So it's just go, go more and more and more. But there is a lot of opportunity also. I mean, obviously you cannot take in a, every single decision, but if you want, there's a lot of opportunity to utilize the information. So one thing is that, so you, if you have a, say five to 10 days, I, I go with five to seven days forecast, so which is your application. You take decision, you take your rapid response. And then for 20 to 21 days, you do your tactical decision. You don't need to do any application because you have a, an update every day or every weekly. And then for three to six months, you take more of a strategic decision. So based on your like El Nino forecast or La Nina forecast, what kind of mechanism you want to put into the system as, as a policymaker. And then you do the planning. You don't need to do the application. So if you use in that way, there's a lot of opportunity. You can utilize it. Like a, for an example, in Thailand, this year is a severe drought. And because of the flood you know, oh, situation in 2011, people are still panic. Government is still panic. So they don't actually put reserves in the you know, uh, big reservoir. They don't put, so the reserve is like in a critical stage at this moment. And with their projection, they saw that they couldn't able to actually provide the sufficient water, even for the water festival that is coming up in next month, which is in April, they do in a new year, it's like a water festival. So they play with water. And they have announced that they will not put so much water because there is a shortage of water, domestic use. But this information actually, they could knew at the beginning of the year, that this is an El Nino year and they are going to have a serious shortage of water. But there was no, you know, action has been taken, no decision has been made by the government at the policy level, and now you are facing lo those consequences. Similarly, a flood, flood uh, prone country like Bangladesh, whenever they see there is a high probability of flooding, they try to make, ensure that they have a sufficient food security, which is important for a country. So they try to order like a rice from other country to stock their warehouse, because they knew that there would be a lot of damage in the, in the, due to flooding. So that kind of strategic decision you could make actually based on your little bit longer horizon uh, prediction. And I try to put together this, uh, the recent one, because everyone may be watching the Tropical Cyclone Winston. So this was like a, on 19th, we predict using an uh, ensemble forecast of ECNWF that how the cyclone looked like. This is an observed cap, you can see the, from the Cyclone Winston observed uh, maximum wave height and then the track. So here you saw that, I mean, there's a lot of possibility. And it, it has a different direction. And this is like a three day in advance. So even though we don't know that where exactly it's going to hit, but we know that it's coming, it's, we know its magnitude, and we could take a lot of preparation if we could do that. Because three days fair enough to taking advance you know, decision to evacuation and other things. And also this is, I think, on 21st, that how the next look like, so where it's going. Because when it go, go from a, a tropical cyclone to, again, it's going to reduce its energy. It model doesn't show very well behavior, so that's why you see the very scattered line. But if you look at the, the, the probability distribution, so when you see that something has a higher probability of 70%, so that has a more you know, chances for hitting us or happening in this situation. And in a real world, I did a small track error analysis for last 10 years. And you can see that a maximum band, when you go for a long horizon forecast, which is like a 120 hours, the landfall could make almost 200 kilometers. So, uh, how it interpret to you. So if you know that a, a cyclone that could be hit 
and your your domain is actually 200 kilometers. So that means you have to actually evacuate all 200 kilometer people. But if you know that your domain is only 10 kilometer, as a disaster manager, it's quite easy for you to evacuate five kilometer band of people. So, so 120 hours, you know the band, and then if you look at a 24 or 48 hours, which is almost 50 kilometers. So you can actually, as a, as, a, as a disaster manager, you could actually easily evacuate an island, which is pretty possible because 24 hours to 48 hours is quite enough lead time to make evacuation process and saving your life. So if we use, if we understand the systems, if we understand the, the likelihood and if we understand the consequences, it's pretty easy actually to work on such kind of uh, forecast information rather than not to rely upon it. I mean, many cases people say, okay, this, this is very complex. I don't know where it's going to be hit. Sometimes, okay, the focus also showing it's coming to the New Zealand. Someone telling whether it's going to the Brisbane. But, you know, if, if you really look at into, in a deep look with the multiple ensembles, and then you can actually able to see how it's going to behave and a little bit closer look. Similarly, this is one of the cases for Hike and Sandy. So when you have a, these are recorded like an ensemble, like a one model, and there could be a several, ensemble could be come up with a different perspectives. So one could be happen with, you use like a five different models. So you maybe have say, if you are familiar with the hydrological model, maybe you use HHMS, you use Mike, you use Delta, uh, Delta views and others hydrological models. So you set one, two, three, five models and you see the five result. Another option is that you use one single model but you use different boundary condition. So that means you change your initial condition and boundary condition and you see the changes, what could be happen. So, so, so once you know see all those ensembles and if you just try to put it into a probability distribution function and then if you try to do and some error error correction you can actually easily predict how or at least a 60 to 50 percent probabilistic way to see that what is the horizon look like next three to five days or at least three to four days in advance for cyclone any questions before I go to the case study? So I just like to translate all these things, how actually we set it up into one single case, because the policymakers like to see the numbers, which is economic value, because if you spend $1 million to setting up a flood models, obviously the question, second question would become, I spent $1 million to set up this early warning systems, how much actually we are getting benefit? from there. If it didn't bring any benefit, why should we have those systems in place? Mm -hmm. Questions, comments, or too boring? No, you put the room until uh, 2 p.m. so we can have plenty of questions yeah. and answers afterwards if you uh, prefer the option. Nothing. <laughs> It's one of the obscure observations that on working in this field in New Zealand is that a lot of the time the warnings and you can have your ECWF models and it's all well and good. You can have your cones of uncertainty and everything, but ultimately those forecasts are never linked to impact, and that's the key thing for communities to understand. You can tell them that Auckland might have 140 kilometres of winds coming from one direction, but that means nothing to them. Yeah. Unless you can actually relate that to impact. So impact based forecasts. Yep are actually probably the most important thing, actually understanding the probability of communities and structure yep. um, and the ability to translate that information to impacts. Yep. Yeah, that, that's very important. I mean, as I said, that you don't internalize the information unless you, uh, you know, you realize it. And one of the good way is to tell them what could be the impact and also what could be the response they could take so that actually they can use, it, use those um, information into decision making. The same thing just I will show in the in the Bangladesh case that how we set up a impact based focused information. So 
I don't know whether many of you know about Bangladesh. It's a very small country, it's a delta in, the, in the Southeast Asia. And it has a maximum elevation is six to seven meters, which is a very flat land, actually. And 68 to 70 percent is actually vulnerable to flood. So even though in a normal year, it goes under flooding. In normal monsoon, 60 percent goes under water. So this is a good place to test any guinea pig. So they're like a guinea pig for us, for a model tester. So all these big models like Sobek, Mike, um, Ripsum, many of these models actually first just went in Bangladesh because of availability of flooding. Because if you don't see a flood in next five years, you cannot prolong your project more than five years. So if you have every year flooding, you can actually test and you can actually mm -hmm. calibrate and update your models. So same case here. So the, after 1998 flood, there was some funding we got from USAID to see that how a probabilistic ensemble forecast could be utilized for this country. And we choose Bangladesh. And also there is a, a big you know, rivers, which uh, the rivers has a discharge like 150 cubic meter. So 150,000 cubic meter. So it's just a huge, massive river. It's like a, like look like a sea. You can see from one side to another. So, so we put as a first case here. And also there is a lot of challenges with you know, neighboring countries on data sharing because India doesn't share the data with this country. So even though if they could have a upstream data from China and India, if you use the celerity function to the travel time, you could easily get five days in advance forecast. But once you don't have a upstream database, it's very hard to know that what it be the look, look like. And it's also controlled. So we try to see that a regional level, that how a numerical weather prediction, like a, using a weather prediction, how you can actually translate into a rainfall runoff model for the country, and how you can increase the lead time. So the objective was for this project actually to increase the lead time that how we can actually increase the lead time from one day to 10 days, and then how we could actually interpret this probabilistic forecast or ensemble forecast into decision making for the users, because different sectors need more longer lead time. So what we did here, we use a several models here. One, I mean, I don't go detail on this modeling system, which is a, you have in a hydrologic world, you have a lump model, you, where you try to put everything as a lump. You have a distributed model, you have a semi-distributed model, so so many kinds. So here we try to use a several models. One is a lump model, one is a semi-distributed, so we divided catchment into a grid. And then we also use some multi-model ensembles, so we integrate several models into one to calibrate and validate. And then for the Getting the regional database, like from India and China, we use like a, a satellite database, uh, like NOAA and NASA satellite information. And then we also utilize the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. So they give quite a little bit high resolution um, rainfall forecast up to 15 days, uh, which has a, around 16 kilometer by 16 kilometer grid resolution, and another one is a 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer grid resolution. So use those all information together to see that how we can actually generate a long lead flood forecasting scheme. And then if you just have a model, it doesn't give you much things, and you cannot ensure that your model is going to be worked or people is going to be utilized. So you have to understand the community level vulnerability and risk, that how much risk they have. So we try to use a small model, which is developed by Hayes. You try to scope out your risk, you characterize your risk, and then you try to evaluate based on your risk management. And that could gives you an idea that how the impact would look like, and then what kind of response mechanism you could set up. But there are thousands of risk models available globally. You can use any, depending on your needs and your criteria that fulfill within the risk models. And so what I did, 
we actually first went to the, before setting up a model, we went to the community. And then we sit with them on a different livelihood people. So farmers, household, fishermen, civil defense peoples, and disaster management officials, and try to understand what kind of decision they actually took during a flooding. What, what is the critical parameter they have to consider? And what is the lead time they are actually looking for? So, so these are the, some of the critical information they provided us that, okay, the farmers, if they could have a 10 days f warning, they could actually harvest easily some of their crops which is in the harvesting stage, or some of the crops which is in the planting stage, they could actually wait for one more week so that they don't lose their seed bed. If you lose your seed bed, you lose actually your whole season. And then also, if you need to take a decision about crop selection, cropping pattern, because there are so many varieties nowadays, uh, salt tolerant, water tolerant, many things. So for that kind of decision, they need a seasonal kind of things, so, uh, which is a six months or three months at least. The household people, which is mostly, you know, we discuss with the home and folks, and so they said, okay, they need 10 days, so even though they, don't, they may don't need 10 days, but they express that they need a 10 days to you know, storage, food, safe drinking water, all sort of things. The fishermen, they need to put a, either net, because those are not a sea, those are a river, so sweet water fish, and they, they do a lot of culture fish. So either they have to you know, catch all the fish, or they need to put some protection so that it doesn't you know, flood it uh, during the flood. So they need at least one week time frame. And similarly for civil defense, they need to mobilize the resources, water, foods, they need to understand the need assessment in the community level, risk and resources. So they need at least five to 10 days period of time. So that actually gives us an idea that how we could actually increase a lead time forecast for 10 days. And even though it's very hard for a scientific point of view, even if you go for a small river, you'll see it's absolutely impossible for 10 days forecast. But a big river, a little bit possible like a Brahmaputra or Mekong, it's just quite a uh, little bit easier than a sm small catchment. And this is a forecast look like. So we produce, we use a, like a 51 ensembles to develop a probabilistic forecast. And you can see this red, these are all my 51 ensembles. This is my danger level the black dot, and the black dot here, this is my observed. So if you look at the uh, eight days, 10 days, nine days, and seven days, so if you look at the trend, it's actually going to match us in every, every single day we able to produce a forecast. But maybe the amount is a little bit wrong. So as, as a user perspective, what information you are looking for? If you are living in a floodplain, I need to know three fundamental information. One is when is flood is coming, how long it's going to stay, and then when it's going to recede so that I can bring back to my normal. A, a discharge uh, 50 or 100 or a water level 1 meter or 1.2 meter or 0 0.7 meter doesn't make much changes actually. Anyway, you have to evacuate or you have to take preparation. So, so if you look at that consideration, the focus is quite good because it didn't tell you exactly the level because I cannot tell you, no one can tell you the level of exact flooding 10 days in advance. One day I can do that, but 10 days, impossible. And then what we try to do a probability of danger level crossing threshold. So you can see that in each case, and this is interesting also that in that country they get, get flooded actually two times. So one is like in the month of mm -hmm. June, and then again at the end of the monsoon, which is October to November area. And then in each case you see the, the danger level probability is almost 90% above. So we, we test these models this project took me more than 12 years, to be frank. I, I was associating with these models, I mean this project, more than 12 years. 
But normally a project, if you see funded by a donor, not goes more than four years, mm -hmm. or maximum three years, or maximum five years. Mm -hmm. So it's just a beyond the horizon, you have to look at it. Because you need to test, unless you go to the community. Because you, you cannot make it operational unless you ensure that model is performing very well. So we use like four years or five years just for testing, hind casting the past event, mm -hmm. that how, how reliable the model shows accuracy and then whether you should go or should not go. If something damage happened, who will be take the responsibility? So there are a lot of tension between the government, policymakers, the warning providers, that whether they should give this information to public or not, so, or experimental kind of things. So once we tested several cases, like last 15, 20 scenarios, we come up with a conclusion that, OK, the model is very stable and it could provide some good information. And then we got some funding to test in some pilot location that how these people could actually accept this kind of information. So we, we come up with a conclusion that when your model provides a more than 70% probability, you can actually go ahead with this to the information to the public. And it's obviously certain that it's going to be happening. But as I said, 70%, that means three times you must go wrong out of 10 times. So we, we try to dis discuss with the community people that, hey, I can give you information 10 days in advance, but it's a 70%. That means out of seven times I tell you, next 10 days, three days I must go wrong. And the, the response I got from a, some old people in the community that only God can tell the truth. Others are right. And they take chances based on their perception, their indigenous knowledge. They look at the water temperature. And based on that, they start dis making their decision. Mm -hmm. So they say there is no harm to getting a new information because they could, they could always validate their information with uh, scientific information. If that you know, don't match with their perception and uh, our perception, then it comes to a conflict and indecision. But it, if it both match together, it, it married very well, actually. So, so that, that, that's how we try to provide the information. And, and this is a validation of the forecast. You see that, as I said, that we need only three fundamental information. The, when the flood is coming, the number of days, so, so you see the flood onset start going to repeat. And this rate, all the rate is like a 100% probability of flood happening. And then when it's going to be green, it's like a recession, flood recession. So you, you know that flood recession, you know the flood onset, and you know the duration. So that's quite enough to, you know, making a decision for different sector at the community level. And even though we try to look at the, the number of times that we give a right forecast and wrong forecast, so which is means the probability of detection to alarm. So if I say yes, it's yes. If I say it's no, it's no. So which is a, a relative operating curve. So if all goes in this side, which is like a, you are true. So you see this. The probability of detection is two, two alarm, and this is your false alarm. So even though there is some false alarm, but most of the cases it, it draw a true alarm. So, so that gives us a lot of confidence, you know, to to go to the community. And then we started, you know, disseminating using a local uh, telecom provider, in s because we got some free SMS under their social and corporate responsibility, like 2,000 users. But the interesting thing is that when we started on the first year the subscriber was not even 20%. Nobody wants to get the, get the information into their mobile because they said, because those days, it's like in 2004, 2005, when you send the forecast, you don't have those smartphone. So you have a small, a small Nokia, normal phone. Mm -hmm. And if you receive more than 10 or 12 <laughs> SMS, it gets jammed. You have to delete everything mm -hmm. to get your memory clear. So after getting some certain information, they said, we don't want your information. Because, you know, it's a day, year one, they don't have any good connection with you, reliability, trust. And they, they don't know, I also want to use the information, what they receive. But when, after one year, they saw that some, you know, improvements, what we said, 
it's happened because when you said, oh, there'll be flooding after 10 days and they saw it's, everything is dry mm -hmm. in the area, they said, oh, we don't trust you. Yeah. But when, it, when they saw really flooding, the second year subscriber was like more than 80% because they start believing the system. But there is also a lot of complaint. You know, people, some people say, oh, I listen to you and I put my, I put my books on the floor and then it's flooded. <laughs> so, so, but, but the good thing is that you know, the, the time it goes, people start trusting on it. But again, here it comes like, you have to be clear that your first few years, you are giving a right forecast. If I'm on the first three years, on the wrong forecast side, I'm gone. This is not going to be happen a success story anymore. Mm -hmm. And then we also try to provide this kind of you know information in a sectoral basis. The major focus was agriculture because the country is uh, more agro dominant, and the major damage happened in the agriculture area. So we try to provide a risk into low, moderate, high, very high in in, in a ten days horizon. And they can actually see in the in the computer in the local government offices that what situation is look like after ten days or after nine days, and then they keep wait maybe one or two days and then they start actually uh, responding the situation. And this is a, like an impact based forecast that Richard was talking about. So we give them a information in a way like okay, if you have an early forecast or an early warning. You look at that. What are the stage of your different crops? Because there are a variety of crops in the field. Some are in the seedling. Some are in the vegetative. Someone is a harvesting. And someone is a nearly mature. And then, what kind of impact it could happen if you have a flood in say 15th of May? And then, when you are looking for a forecast, how how long you are looking for a forecast horizon? And what are the alternative you can actually do? Or what decision you have to take? So we give this kind of training to all these farmers in a, like a farmer's field school. We call it like a climate field school kind of stuff. So we bring them and we try to teach them that this could be happen and this is the impact, what you do, what could be done, what could be the alternatives. And then they try to prepare themselves in that particular way. So th in a sense like, for an example, if you have a, mature, a crop which has a maybe 80% mature, as a farmer, so we always want to wait for optimum, which is 100%. So the thing is that if you listen to me, my forecast, so there is a chance of you save 80% of your crop, you lose 20% if you do harvesting. If you don't listen to me, there could be two scenarios. One is you gain 100% because my focus is wrong. Or you lose 100%. My focus is right. So we try to give this kind of way to communicate the risk that, OK, this is the scenario. As a farmer, it's your property, your right. You take your decision. In this kind of countries, they don't have insurance, unfortunately. So if they could have insurance, they could actually play with the insurance there. So we, we try to give this kind of scenario to them and then let them decide what they want to do. Some people, they take chances. So they save 80%. Some people lose 100%. Mm -hmm. So that, that was a case in the, in the, in the field. And, and th these are the, some of the way that we try to you know, train up to the agriculture extension worker. We try to go to the community to show in a map that how to read the maps. We try to discuss with the local disaster management committee because they are the decision maker at the community level to make a decision that what kind of response they should take. So we try to give them some briefing. We also sometimes bring the national forecaster with us. So because he is always on the TV news. And when you bring this kind of celebrity to the very remote community, they feel like, oh, I know him very well. Though he didn't see him face to face, but he's seen him on the television. And he feels like, okay, whatever he's saying is true. It's, it, we can start believing on, on the things. So that, that kind of mechanism we try to uh, implement to see that how people start receiving the information. 
And these are the some of the response. You can see that people change, start changing their livelihood because boat is the only means of communication. So they start preparing the boat. They move in a small you know, embankment because, as I said, it's a flat land. So only the embankment, they make a temporary housing. Livestock is very important for them. So they try to put their livestock in a safe place. They put net on the small ponds where they do culture fisheries. Or they sometimes catch fish early to sell out in the market. So that kind of response we saw in the, in the particular area which is a not a big community, it's only 200 uh, household community we try to apply. And then after the flood in 2008, I went there to come up with an assessment that, okay, we spent like a million of millions of dollars, how much actually we able to make it as a dollar value? So only in one event, the, the one that I show in 2007 flooding, uh, the people who were able to save their livestock, there, each of the household, they were able to save like four hundred eighty-five dollar. Mm -hmm. Agriculture, one hundred and eighty. Uh, Fisher is one hundred and twenty per household. And then in two thousand twelve, a team from World Bank visited on the same area to do an assessment, and they come up with the conclusion that if you spend one dollar for an early warning system, which has a you know one in two years a severe flooding consequences it could actually bring you a return around $40 worth benefit, and you could realize it in a 10 years period of time. I did the same study for Samoa for a cyclone, after cyclone event, 2009, and it brings me that if Samoa could have such kind of system in place, it could give them $1 investment against $4 worth benefit, which is not much because cyclone doesn't come every year to Samoa. So you have to look at on that, that perspective. But even though it's a, a quite huge, you know, an uh, enormous benefit that could bring. So if a, this assessment has been done only a 200 community, so if it, this could be done for a nationwide, you can count the number, that how much actually you're able to benefit. Maybe that would be failure, you know, day curve, the formula that you have for early warning system. So, so th that's the case study, and then there has been a lot of publications under on this particular case study. This is one of the best case for UN ISDR, which I wrote in uh, 2013. Uh, there is a nice book we developed under uh, UNDP in Springer. Also, so many of other cases that you will find on early warning systems. It's a good one if you read that one. If you do research, this is a good book for doing research. And also, this is one of the recent publications in the International Journal for Disaster Risk, um, published, uh, I think, last year, December, uh, on the benefit that we are able to get using a probabilistic forecast. So that's basically the end of my talk. If you have any questions, we have still one hour. Yeah, thanks so much, Bethan, for that. It's Great, fascinating discussion. Uh, any, yeah, comments, questions, worries? You have something? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I do have like a, a bit of a question. I remember in, uh, in 2011 during the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, there was this, uh, well, a lot of people there. Um, well, they all, of course, they always um, experience a lot of earthquakes, but and each time they always get tsunami warnings. So what happened during that during that time was that they got the tsunami warning, and m most of the old elder residents they did not believe the tsunami warning because you know they've had a lot of earthquakes before, but never a tsunami. So I was just wondering how you know how how how, how could we possibly address that 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 mindset? Mm -hmm. Well, th th that's always challenging for uh, I think every single case because as I said that once your memory faded or you never mm -hmm. expected in your lifetime or even in your earlier generation it's hard to believe that this could be happen. It's like uh, for, for myself I mean I, because mm -hmm. I'm not ignorant I understand the problems even though my house was completely flooded in 2011 and then my prediction was the water level could be a maximum 1.5 meter, mm -hmm. and then I what 
I, I tried to move some of my furniture from, you know, from the ground floor to the upstairs, and then many of the things we couldn't be able to relocate, so we put in the in, in top of a dining table. Mm -hmm. So from the ground level, I, my house plinth level is one meter, and then from my plinth level, a dining table is another one meter. So I said, okay, those would be safe, like a microwave, other important things. And then we immediately rescue. But the flood water was actually more than two meters. <laughs> and it stayed more than two months. So all the furniture, you know, that those IKEA furniture, is actually melted. It's, it's completely melted. So when we enter in the house after three months, so I saw my refrigerator was in the drawing room, and then my table was like flipped down because everything melted, the, the woods, and everything damaged. And then we are like a homeless more than six months. So uh, this, that's the case of myself. I mean, even though I, mean, I, I knew that a flood is coming, but after flood, the way I realize the situation or uh, how I feel now, because I never faced that, that kind of flooding in my lifetime. So mm -hmm. I believe, oh, it's coming, but I never understand the consequence of what can be happen, how much I could be impacted, what is the scenario. So that, that's hard. So only the motivation could help. And uh, the, the, the way you could actually motivate people. But it's, it's really hard to give them a belief, especially to the old people. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, the one that I show for the Bangladesh case, as I said, that the first year, as I said, only 20% people believed on the system, system. But when they saw that something, what we told, it happened really. And you see the jump from the believers from 20 to 70%. So that, that was a big change, you know, changing the culture, changing the mindset, that they start believing on the long lived flood forecasting system. But I remember that when I went first time to meet them and identify their needs, and I told them that I can give you something like that, they said, you people from coming from the national, you sell, tell a lot of story, and you go back again, you never come back. So they don't trust you. Mm -hmm. But once you are able to show something, a value addition, that is important. So if you're able to show something which, which is really meaning to them, and it brings something value addition, Maybe not in the beginning year, but on the consecutive year, you will be able to see the changes. But this again relies again, like if you have a cyclone once in a 50 years time, so you, you realize, but after 50 years, if you don't memorize those things, you forgot again. So that, that's, that's again the challenge and how you deal with social and behavioral science. That's a, a big domain, which nothing um, I do have expertise. Yes, please. I mean, there are several ways you could go for building trust, and then, and it's, there is no shortcut. It's just an evolving process, I always say. So, the, the first mechanism that we, we share here, the, like some t tactics we use, we brought some of the uh, celebrity whom they could trust. You have to find out with the community that who are the trusted people for them. And it's just a various. Uh, like, a country like Bangladesh, if you go there, people trust a local uh, Muslim mosque, you know, the head, instead of a local government people. They never trust a government people. My, my grandfather was a meteorologist, and he was the director of a meteorological department, and he was known to be a best liar in the country, <laughs> and within the family. Because when I, whenever he said tomorrow will be rain, there's no rain. It's totally dry. And when I say it's dry, it's start raining. 
So I, now I understand that how difficult it was those days for them to predict. But even though till today, even in a weather like uh, Auckland, it's hard to predict. Yeah? You see something on the app, it happened totally, completely different. So it's very, very difficult to bring in those kind of things. But uh, again, I mean, you have to find first and identify who are the major agent, whom the pe people trust. Other people trust the civil defense people, people trust the local head, people trust the mayor. So you approach to him, to talking to them. And that will bring some trust among the community. But if you bring someone who is not at all trusty to the community, it's very hard to bring or penetrate in that particular society. Yeah, I've got two uh, related questions, actually. Uh, the first is about your list of uh, reasons for the failure of early warning systems. Could there be a fourth one? Of course. Which could be that those in need actually never receive the warning signal. Okay, yeah. Which would be on top of the Yeah, the so that, that means that there is no warning. Or oh, at least no warning reaching does in need. Which yeah. is different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is the last mile issue that yeah. I mean the weakest link to the last mile. Absolutely. In a top down kind of approach to warning. Yeah, that could be the first one. If you don't have any, you have no information, basically. And my second question based on that is uh, related to local knowledge. You touched upon that at some point. Uh, how could we sort of encourage early warning systems in a more integrative fashion. So with some sort of uh, top-down kind of uh, uh, system, a kind of chain of command from the med service, the government, the people. Uh, but as we are a sort of bottom-up, bottom. integrated approach through uh, local knowledge and, and um, early warning signals from uh, the mm -hmm. community good marks. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you that we all, I, I also add one more component here, which is like a, you, you are looking at the vertical only, top down and bottom up, but also there's, yeah, a, the there's a horizontal as well. So, so how you actually mix all into together, and this is quite complex environment eh, because you need a physical scientist here who rarely actually understand the social science. And you need to have a good social scientist, which is a bottom-up, who really wants to collaborate on physical science. It's even, even an issue for social scientists. Because yeah. local knowledge is often intangible. Yeah, so, so how do you make that knowledge tangible for scientists at large to actually trust? Yeah, so, so you see that it's, it's a need to have a big harmonization between this so physical scientist, social scientist, and a communicator. So which is like always we say, uh, provider versus users. So the providers are more on like a physical scientist and users, I could say, like a social scientist and the community itself. That how you understand each other's needs and how you actually incorporate those needs into action. And you'll not see many people actually working in the bridging areas. That so who has a strong domain in the physical scientist and also he has a strong domain in the, in the, the social scientist. So it, you'll not find many people in this, in, in globally itself. And that's maybe one of the reasons that the system doesn't work very well. And even if you look at the information flow channel, you'll see there's a two-directional flow. It's like a push and pull when the disaster start strike. So if it strike today, right after that, you'll see there is a push and pull information, like a government sending information, and then online community people like Facebook, Twitter, they are also pushing information. So it's just wide, going very widely. But look at, at the pre-disaster phase. How, how much uh, early warning actually we do push and pull? It's more on like a push from one push because it's only made service who provide uh, some sort of information, but it's not goes in that larger domain that need to be done goes especially in the uh, during and post and then there is a lot of publication also in that particular domain that how they interact each other what kind of phenomena need to be worked together so it's a, in a sense I mean it's, it's a very complex environment but it's not doable I mean it's possible to possible to 
uh, enhance that particular areas once we have some uh, willingness to work together. As long as we understand each other's needs and problems, we could actually customize and try to incorporate. And if I cannot co incorporate, I could tell frankly that this is my limit. I, I cannot go beyond that because science has its own limit. And you cannot go further, you cannot push from, from there. And as a user, you have to understand that things that, okay, I can get up to this level. I cannot get, get this one. So I, whatever I have to do deals with, I have to deal with up to this, this information. So if you both understand in this particular domain, it's quite easy. But in most of the cases, it never works. A any single disaster, on the next day morning, if you open the newspaper, you see some failure story. You'll see people are complaining that, okay, there is a uh, warning failure because people doesn't understand. It didn't reach to the last mile. Or there was a communication broke. There was no mobile technology. So th these are a, a common phenomena, common problems we see all the time. And it's not like right now. I can show you a, a newspaper for, from 1975 or 1875 Hawaii. Tsunami, first tsunami. Right after that, they come up with a conclusion or the communication broken. The people doesn't understand the system, early warning system. So all, all sort of things. And in 20th century, we are talking about the same things. So as, as a scientist, it's just so frustrating for us because we are talking the same thing again and again, but we are not able to solve those problems. But in a, in a sense, it could be minimized. It could be solved. Uh, I don't see any problems to making that happen, but it's not, it's not at that stage. So now it's really less, uh, if you are a social scientist in the room, how much you are willing to cope up with physical science information. If you are willing, <laughs> you'll be able to do very good in your, in your career. And actually they're doing very well. I mean, I saw many social scientists or anthropologists who now just working with us to understand the um, okay, future climate modeling phenomena, how it works, what are the uncertainty, what are the challenges, and then they try to interpret into a very nice way it, how it could be deals with. Often the issue is to actually find the space. Yeah. To actually open up the dialogue. Yeah. Whether it's through tools, whether it's through uh, uh, something else, to actually facilitate the dialogue. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, we, we try to facilitate from, from UN, UNDP, especially in the Asian countries. I try to set up like in Vietnam, Philippines, um, Cambodia, uh, India, and Nepal. We called it like a climate forum, or we, ch we changed the name based on the country demand. Some, some are recorded climate field school. Some are, some are in Bangladesh, we said it Munson Forum. And in Vietnam, it's a climate forum. In the uh, Philippines, it's El Nino Forum in Myanmar's El Nino Forum. So where we try to bring this user and provider into one common platform to share what the need as a user and as a provider, what is the season look like and how much you can actually provide based on the needs. And then at the end of the year, they sit down together again to evaluate that, okay, whatever I gave you, how much you use those information or how much it was correct. And then what kind of benefit you're able to get or what kind of you know, losses you made based on the decision or information product. So that reduces some kind of tension between these two and that gives a lot of opportunity to interact this social scientist and you know, physical scientist in one common plat pl platform. Might ask you a more physical, physical question. Here. Absolutely. So to get towards some local context, I suppose we look at um, Australia and our cousins over there and think, how lucky they are that um, 17 hours ahead of time they know how much water is going to protect their township. And we think, yeah, that's lucky. And then we look at your examples and say, like I did, um, that's uh, cyclonic stuff. We've got cyclones, and so it's going to hit the whole region. And so you know that um, it's, it's that whole um, community that we need to talk to. But then coming to um, Auckland or New Zealand, we think, well, the, um, most of our extreme events um, to the rainfall aren't caused by cyclones. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's going to be part of our community that we need to, to talk to. 
around, around the whole community. Absolutely. And, um, and they, they were in a, um, a much more difficult situation um, in that we were talking before about getting it right, the number of times you get it wrong, the number of times you get it right. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's all kind of very necessary. How do you see um, translating what you've done into that more New Zealand context, whether it's down by um, the Grey River? Mm-hmm. I, I, I mean, as similar could I mean maybe a tender focus is not a, not a good example for a New Zealand case because we have a very small river basin and it doesn't impact on that particular. But for a extreme weather even kind of things, which brings you a lot of rainfall and maybe a flash flooding kind of situation, uh, there we could have had a lot of opportunity to utilize some of the state-of-art models that exist, and not only one like ECMWF, you could use many others like NCEP and other uh, GFS uh, initial condition to see the situation that bringing to our territory and then how much is the probability on that particular um, event that could bring its the chances. And then we could actually start dialogue. I mean, if, even if you look at hindcast for last uh, 20 or 30 events that haven't happened. So for an example, at Willington, which goes flooding, flooding is a common. So a case study for Willington could be easily possible to predict at least six hours to 12 hours ahead of forecast. And based on that, what kind of impact it could happen and what kind of response they could take. At least their car, sh- car should not be flying in the water. So at least they could sh- take that kind of you know precaution ma- measures that are able to make them a little bit resilient than, you know, a super unexpected situation. I think the physical side of things changes, changes your approach to it. I think the board approach is, you know, it's about right, but if you're looking at um, Auckland, for example, you know, it's not a large river that's going to burst its banks and, and flood a city, so mm-hmm. that's, that's more of that um, emphasis on understanding what rainfall is going to occur and where and how much certainty yep. that you've um, Uh, you have to look always a more comprehensive. I mean, if a death toll is always a important because obviously you may be measures in a comprehensive way or with a, um, your um, asset value, like a damage, the total damage, as well as uh, uh, the people who lost their houses and then you know homeless, so those, those kind of situation. But I put a, a death toll is always. Which, which you cannot compensate with any any kind of you know measures. So if you could at least award them, you could save lives. Property would be damaged anyway because you cannot save property for a big flooding or a big cyclone, and we cannot actually control on that particular things in a, in a short time uh, period. But uh, in, a, in a point of early warning systems, uh, I think that if you could actually save at least one people's lives, that's a huge achievement. For, for the overall system perspectives. So we, that's why I put an emphasis that if you could actually reduce the number of death toll, like even for a Bangladesh case, said 1991, uh, 100,000 people died. A same magnitude cyclone happened in 2010, which is a um, cyclone cedar, 10,000 people dead. So the government came up with a big flash, flash news that 
we are more resilient because the death toll has been dramatically reduced from 100,000 to 10,000. But 10,000 is a 10,000, that's a huge, a lot of people dead. One people dead is a, is a, is a, a death. So, I mean, h how you compare that things into in terms of, you know, your achievements towards the, towards the good system? So, because so. So, my, my question is going to be as well, the information that you were disseminating to your communities in Bangladesh, what with that information was that, yes, it's going to flood, and now it's not going to flood? Because for individual households, it would be distinctly different, and that's what we see, you know, warming all from the flood by a splash, but you can tell the community that it's going to flood, but I think a metre and a half of water to someone's house is, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, uh, as uh, we worked in a small community, it was easy for us actually to distinguish the, the level of risk that I show you in a map. It's a high, moderate, low, very high. And then we actually did a household survey and put a sticker in every household that what is the level of risk they are. Mm -hmm. So if I say that, okay, you are going to be having a one meter flooding, we say a number amount, but it's not maybe the exact uh, is that okay? The flood would, water would be one meter, but when you say that one, it, it, you can actually relate with one meter at the river. What would be the uh, risk at your household level? So whether you are in a, if you are in a green sticker zone, that means you don't have to evacuate. But if you are in a yellow and red, you have to evacuate. Those kind of situations. So we we are able to distinguish into different level of risk, but not in a. That, that I put in. That's why like a low, moderate, high, not into number. So if you say, okay, we say always like a, a water level would be 0 0.7 to 1.2. So we put a band. And within that band, it's, you see the forecast, it actually matches within the band areas. And then people, and you able to put your risk profile within the band area, and that people can able to respond. Can I just have one more question? Yes, please. <laughs> Um, you mentioned some um, synergies between once you've got an area and once in place and you've got a resilient community. You have to undertake comprehensive disaster risk reduction initiatives to actually have a resilient community. Absolutely. Uh, uh, system oh, no, no, no. Solve it. no. So, um, in terms of um, uh, liaising with local government authorities on actually moving people or not building in these sorts of areas or putting in community network initiatives to ensure that other people are communicating, mm -hmm. is that? Was that part of this program, or did you just focus on the system? No, we just focus on early warning system, because that's a huge domain, actually. If you look at the, the overall community resilience perspectives, because it's not only a early warning or a, not only a DRR, but also many other systems in which their livelihood, their land use, their economy, uh, all sort of things in, interrelated. And we didn't go into that, that bigger domain just we try to focus on an early warning system and how much it brought to the benefit to the community aspect, but not, not the whole domain. Following on this question, uh, where are the people, the locals, uh, only relying upon your uh, signal for uh, knowing about the threat, or did you set up some local kind of warning devices like the usual bamboo pole in the river with tricot or uh, scheme and those kind of things? So based, we, on your, based on your assessment of the probability. Yeah. yeah. So what, what we did in, under this one, we channel because, you know, as a, nobody from the private could send out a forecast. It's not the mandate of any country, only the legal mandate authority. So for Auckland, maybe Civil Defense Authority or Met Office, they're the authorized people. So we, we sent, we didn't forecast anything to the public. We give this information directly to the government, which is like a uh, flood forecasting and a warning center, they call it in that country, or like a, um, and then they send out the, there's a two mechanism we set up. One is the, the existing government mechanism, which is a little bit slower. So you have a national, then you have a provincial, then it goes to the district, from district to the local council. That's, that's the way it works in there. And that's pretty slow. And at the same time, we set up some community initiatives, which is like a, we, we put a, a volunteer for each of the, say, five to 10 households, you have a one volunteer who actually receive a direct SMS from the center. And then his responsibility is to send out to the door-to-door, -door, so person-to-person information provider. And also we 
disseminate the information using a local, directly to the local government. Uh, they have an information center where they can actually see in a screen the level of risk they are looking at next 10 days. And we always encourage people to look at into first day and two day because you may don't need a 10 days in advance. So you observe the situation one day, two day, three day, and then when you see a consistency, you start responding to the situation. So all, everything goes through government, but additionally for this particular case, we set up some local volunteers to make it a more comprehensive as well as sensitize to the local community people. Okay. I got one more for that. Yep. Uh, did the, the mobile phone uh, system work? I have my own experience with that, which is very bad. In Samoa, in 2011, September, when there was an earthquake in Tonga, uh, so I was in the hotel in Apia and uh, didn't know, and it, it shook. I mean, we felt the earthquake. Get out of the room, and then the room next door was a family from American Samoa who had lost someone in the tsunami 2009. So we decided to move up in the hill, and there were only a few of us. Uh, so we decided to come back, and then um, at the time I, I had a, a SIM card from Digicel, so I was a subscriber to the local provider. And I got to know a week afterwards that the government actually issued a message, a watch, through the mobile phone telling people not to move. Uh, I never received the message. <laughs> Someone from the government office who actually sent the message in the first place sent it to me while she was sitting next to me at 10 p.m. one night. I received the message the following morning at half past seven. So the, the system totally failed in terms of I mean, the, I'm not sure if it's the network, if it's the provider, if it's the signal. Uh, I'm not sure. Right? It, it, it failed. I, I, to I totally agree with you. That's why I said that you have to have a multiple and redundant system in place. For your flooding, because it's, it's, it's a little bit slow on set, your river flooding, flash flood may be more f um, quick in set. So your uh, mobile system more or less works. It doesn't hamper much on, on, a, on a case of flooding. But for cyclone and tsunami, you cannot guarantee on mobile communication, especially for cyclone. Because when you have a high wind, you, some of your tower goes blown up. It's, then also, uh, not only for that, you get condition between the, in, the, in, the, in the lines because so many people want to call at the same time and your system fails. So uh, I, I would always recommend that you should have a multiple communication systems. For a cyclone, we have a different system. We use like a VHF and HF communication, which is more reliable during the high wind um, or uh, I mean the velocity. And also some other local indigenous, you know, they, they try to put bamboo stick, bales, uh, many, many more options. So use as long as, as much as system you have in place, utilize every single uh, possible means of communication. One system is not a good system or one system is not a reliable system for, you know, warning dissemination. That's Do you get any point. feedback on what's happening in Nepal at the moment, which seems to be the big thing? The the, the community-based uh, flood warning system they set up uh, with mobile phone uh, providers and practical action and a few other partners. It seems to be the big thing at the moment uh, yeah. in South Asia. Is yeah, I mean, this is working actually quite well. I mean, because uh, they, they are looking at more on uh, low onset kind of, not the rapid onset disaster kind of situation. And then they try to provide uh, uh, every day, day to day basis, uh, weather, weather information. So weather forecast, you send out by email. They also set up some sort of like a push and pull services. So you have a call center. So if you call and then you can know about the weather, that what is the weather look like for next three days to seven days. So that, that kind of mechanism they try to establish at the community level using a mobile broadcasting and um, with some interpretation. So it's not like directly science information because it has a only 144 character is SMS. So they interpret these things as, so okay, you have more water, you have less water, you may have a flooding, or they put plus, 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 three cent, a different country, I saw a different kind of mechanism they started. But you know, telecom, telecom sector is now really active for some of this emergency communication stuff through ITU support. It's changed very substantially since 2011 as well. So we, mm -hmm. uh, it was in 2011 most of the messages were received were pushed by text. 
they can actually now completely take over the cell network and cell broadcast, mm -hmm. which prioritizes all mm -hmm. cell phones. So if your phone is polling with a particular cell site, they can target those cell sites and push every phone polling with that site. That technology is not available in New Zealand at the moment, but there's a business case for the government to put that through within the next few years. Um, technology is used in Australia for flooding, uh, and right through America, if you buy a phone and handset from America, it will be pre downloaded. It's evolved substantially. But yep. again, if you're visiting Samoa, you probably need to understand the understand the business before you go and know what to do and then get something happens. It's kind of over if, if you're traveling, it's really up to yourself to understand where you're going and relying on a, a phone network to receive all the Yeah. Uh, even I mean um, you know, we set up this uh, siren tower for tsunami for say Thailand. So I installed like a ninety nine siren tower along the beaches. But how can you guarantee that if you uh, if you are in a holiday because mostly people, that's a tourist area, Phuket, for an example. You are a tourist. You are in your hotel rooms with the air condition is running, and you are drunk a little bit. And how you ensure that there is a warning message is going on outside and it will be reached to your you know your attention at at the hotel room inside the hotel. So. It's just a com complex. It's called unlucky. <laughs> unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> and next next morning you see you're floating in the water. <laughs> Any further comments, queries, questions?